Hello, everyone, and welcome to Expressions of Faith. Happy Easter. I pray you guys are having a great day and that all is well with you and your families. Today, I am doing days 36 through 38 of Lent, and day 36 prompt is reach, and the scripture reference is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, and I'm going to read verses 9 through 14, and it reads, the Lord does not delay and is not tardy or slow about what he promises, according to some people's conception of slowness. But he is long-suffering, extraordinarily patient toward you, not desiring that any should perish, but that all should turn to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will vanish, pass away with a thunderous crash, and the material elements of the universe will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and the works that are upon it will be burned up. Since all these things are thus in the process of being dissolved, what kind of person ought each of you to be in the meanwhile, in consecrated and holy behavior and devout and godly qualities, while you wait and earnestly long for, expect and hasten the coming of the day of God, by reason of which the flaming heavens will be dissolved and the material elements of the universe will flare and melt with fire. But we look for new heavens and a new earth, according to his promise, in which righteousness, uprightness, freedom from sin, and right standing with God is to abide. So, beloved, since you are expecting these things, be eager to be found by him at his coming, without spot or blemish, and at peace and serene confidence, free from fears and agitating passions and moral conflicts. Hallelujah. When we fulfill our responsibilities, we'll see more of God's sovereign action. Many are waiting on God when God is actually waiting on them. The day of the Lord in Scripture is distinguished from the day of man. The former refers to instances when God intervenes in the affairs of man, and the latter refers to instances when sinful man appears to be in control of the world. The phrase day of the Lord denotes different divine interventions in different scripture passages. Here, it refers specifically to the coming great tribulation period when God will govern the affairs of man in a more direct and open way than he does at the present. At the end of the tribulation, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, the elements will burn and be dissolved, and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. Since the things this world values are to be dissolved in this way, believers should stop focusing on worldly success and achievement. Instead, they should focus on holy conduct and godliness. In other words, we must abandon what is temporary and embrace what is eternal. Doing so will hasten the coming of the day of God. Peter is not saying humans can change God's sovereign timetable, Rather, when a believer focuses every moment of life on pleasing God and doing his will, time seems to fly by like it does on a busy workday in which we hasten from one task to another. Based on God's promise, his followers are to be active in their obedience as they wait for divine intervention in their lives, waiting ultimately for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells, a promise God made to his people long, long ago. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Day 37's prompt is fallen. And the scripture reference is Revelation chapter 2, verse 5. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. To the angel messenger of the assembly church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars, which are the messengers of the seven churches in his right hand who goes about among the seven gold lampstands, which are the seven churches. I know your industry and activities, laborers toil and trouble, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot tolerate wicked men, and have tested and critically appraised those who call themselves apostles, special messengers of Christ, and yet are not, and have found them to be imposters and liars. I know you are enduring patiently and are bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not fainted or become exhausted or grown weary. But I have this one choice to make against you, that you have left, abandoned the love that you had at first. You have deserted me, your first love. Remember then from what heights you have fallen. Repent, change your inner man, 
to meet God's will and do the works you did previously when first you knew the Lord, or else I will visit you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you change your mind and repent. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus reminds the pastor, angel of the church in Ephesus, that he holds pastors in his right hand and walks among churches. Jesus knows what's going on. Because of this, he could say, I know your works, your labor, and your endurance. He also knew they did not tolerate evil people. They tested everything by the scriptures and rightly found that some called apostles did not teach pure doctrine. Moreover, the Ephesian believers persevered amid hardships for the sake of Christ's name. There were a lot of positive things happening in this church. But Jesus shifts from patting them on the back to rebuke. You have abandoned the love you had at first. They had correct doctrine, but not a correct heart. The key word here is first, not love. As with romantic love between a man and a woman, first love always involves passion. Yet there was not passionate pursuit of an intimate relationship with Christ in this church. They were merely following a program. Duty had replaced devotion. The remedy was to remember how it used to be when the church was excited about Jesus and returned to their attitude. If the church failed to repent, Christ will remove its lampstand, that is, put out its light. If our church's activity is about us rather than about Jesus, he'll remove his presence from it. The Ephesians hated the practices of evil people, but that positive did not outweigh their loss of passion for Christ. They needed to remember the primacy of relationship over performance. To repent of their spiritual departure and to repeat prioritizing intimate fellowship with God. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord, for your word. Day's 38 prompt is wake up. And the scripture reference is Revelation 3, verses 1 through 3. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. And it reads, And to the angel messenger of the assembly church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God, the sevenfold Holy Spirit, and the seven stars. I know your record and what you are doing. You are supposed to be alive, but in reality, you are dead. Rouse yourselves and keep awake and strengthen and invigorate what remains and is on the point of dying. For I have not found a thing that you have done. Any work of yours meeting the requirements of my God are perfect in his sight. So call to mind the lessons you received and heard. Continue to lay them to heart and obey them and repent. In case you will not rouse yourselves and keep awake and watch, I will come upon you like a thief, and you will not know or suspect at what hour I will come. Yet you still have a few persons named in starters who have not sold their clothes, and they shall walk with me in white, because they are worthy and deserving. Thus shall he who conquers is victorious, be clad in white garments, and I will not erase or blot out his name from the book of life. I will acknowledge him as mine, and I will confess his name openly before my Father and before his angels. Hallelujah. The seven spirits of God is a reference to the Holy Spirit. This church had a reputation for being alive. It was the kind of place about which people today might say, they have great music and great preaching. Yet because Jesus knew their works, he saw there was no true spiritual life there. They were merely playing church. The believers in Sardis then were to stop the spirits of sleeping. The remedy included remembering what you have received and heard. Jesus warned that he was coming in judgment. But as he does repeatedly with his people, he gave the church and Sardis an opportunity to repent first. Notably, a few believers in this church were committed spiritually and not in spiritual apathy. White clothes for the one who conquers represents the garments required for a special event, like a gown or a tuxedo of today. The promise to never erase his name from the book of life is not a reference to eternal life because every believer has a secure place in heaven. Instead, the names in this book are invitees to special fellowship with God, to an exclusive party, so to speak. For those who persist in spiritual vitality, the special clothes and invitation lists are two parts of the same metaphor, a banquet with God for those who conquer. At that banquet, Jesus will brag on the conquerors before his father and before his angels. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Oh, Lord, Jesus will brag on those of us. 
who have persisted in spiritual vitality. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. I pray that these prompts have blessed your life today. I pray you're having a happy Easter. And I'm so glad you guys have joined me for these 40 days of Lent. It's only two more prompts left. And my intention is to upload those prompts on tomorrow. Again, thank you guys for watching. And remember, subscribe, like, and share. Please give this video a thumbs up. Please do that for me. I love you guys with the love of the Lord. And remember, it's all about Jesus. It's all about him. Until next time, enjoy the rest of the video. Bye-bye.